CNBC TV 18 and CNBC Avas present the Read Connect in partnership with IRA. Hello and welcome to Read Connect, where we tell you how real estate investment trusts can become an important part of your diversified portfolio. Now, to discuss more about REITs, we have with us Mr. V. Jay Shankar of Kotak Investment Banking and Ritvik Bhattacharjee of Embassy REIT. Gentlemen, so good to have you on CNBC TV 18. My first question to you, uh, Jay Shankar, you have seen so many types of asset classes come to the equity market, come to the stock markets. What differentiates REIT as a product and how does it connect with the Indian mindset of investing? So REIT uh, is uh, the most efficient way of owning real estate, highly transparent, highly liquid, and it gives you uh, total returns which kind of compares somewhat to that of an equity product and its overall distribution is far, far superior to debt. So Ultimately, investors find a need to own that as a separate asset class given its attractive returns. Yes. You look at the global context, there are about $2.5 trillion of uh, REIT as an asset class. India is just about $10 billion five years after the first REIT uh, listed. So yeah. we have a long way to go and there's a huge, huge uh, opportunity uh, going forward. All right. So huge runway there and especially looking at the kind of success that REITs have had globally. Now, Ritwik, in terms of the traction from the investor community and you have a direct interface with several types of investors, what is it that attracts them to REIT and how is the traction? You know, it, it, that's, that's a great question because when we listed Embassy REIT in 2019, we really didn't know what to expect from the Indian market. As you rightly pointed out, REITs have been um, around for a long time in a global context, as Jay said as well. And since for 60 years, they've been sort of part and parcel of an investor psyche of the real estate uh, diverse portfolio that uh, exists worldwide, but just not in India. And the reason for that has been that, you know, commercial real estate was very difficult for Indian investors or foreign investors in India to get their hands around simply because the track record hasn't been very good. So taking that forward, after we listed, we predominantly started with uh, foreign portfolio investors m making up the majority of the register. Uh, simply because they knew what REITs were like globally, how they've performed. But as we continued to perform during the first five years that we listed, including some very difficult years during COVID, we saw mutual funds uh, take up more of the register. We saw retail investors become more of the register, so much so that we've gone from 4,000 uh, retail holders at IPO to close to 90,000 right now. And mutual funds were less than probably a percentage of our register at IPO and now are 25%, close to 25% of the register. So clearly, there's an incredible amount of domestic acceptance. But as Jay pointed out, there's a lot more to do. That's right. Uh, so Jay, uh, you know, you have an interface with the investor community while you pitch for these IPOs. Now, when it comes to REIT, the traction has grown in both retail as well as from foreign uh, investors and also domestic institutional investors. What are the key questions that domestic investors and institutions generally ask and what attracts them most? Yeah, that's a, a pretty interesting question, I would say. Uh, you know, a lot of the mutual funds, for example, have raised hybrid funds, yes. uh, balance funds, balance advantage funds, where they want to get the right balance between equity and, and debt, and it sits in beautifully over here. So you look at some of the largest mutual funds which have a huge corpus in these areas, and these guys own a fairly large proportion of embassy, own a pretty large proportion in case of Brookfield, Mindspace, as well as the Nexus uh, Retail REIT. So there's a huge appetite, therefore, for mutual funds to own not just in the large cap, mid cap, or small cap, but also in balanced uh, uh, funds, which give you a very attractive return, which, which call it is in the, in the uh, mid-teens. When it comes to the foreign institutional investors, uh, you know, all of them are looking at 10% plus dollar return. So they are looking at it as equity product, not as a debt product, unlike in India where you're looking at it as equity-like, a balanced fund, a hybrid uh, investment strategy from a, from a mutual fund or insurance company point of view. And I think over a period of time, even in India, you probably may have the same characteristics and all these definitions may perhaps melt away because today it's only about 10 billion. Who knows? Five years from today, it could be 20, 25 billion dollars, few more REITs getting uh, listed or few more acquisitions being done by the existing players. 
Right, a few more acquisitions. So this particular space is action-packed in terms of the propensity and the growth opportunities. Now, Ritwik, it is a dream of every Indian to have enough in gold invested, uh, along with the stocks and other uh, you know, asset classes, and also to own a property. Now, this particular asset class gives a very small ticket size in which you can own a part of a commercial property. At the moment, it hasn't uh, really expanded to residential uh, in India, maybe at some point uh, later. But this particular bit, how, how is the attraction when it comes to the property investment and offsetting other types of property investment and coming towards REIT and the tax benefits? What all really works with Indian mindset? Great question. I think fundamentally what this has done for the Indian investor who's looked at real estate is it's really moved people away from what the fragmentation of fractional ownership was. Physical property ownership, particularly around an office, in my mind has just been very, very difficult to manage. Right? Whether or not uh, you, you sit on the receiving end of maybe not having enough disclosure, it's not transparent. And I think what a REIT did was give you the option to invest much like you just do with a share of a company. And that's what it is. You think you just invest on in a stock exchange with one unit. You think about what we do at Embassy REIT. For tw over 20 quarters, we have given the kind of disclosure that we've been commended on globally, where you can see exactly what's happening with the assets, what we're doing with the, all the fundraisers and the, the development that we're doing. We pay out distributions every quarter. And REITs actually in this country are, were, are only supposed to pay out distributions semi-annually, but we've taken the governance bar so high because we take our role as part of the fiduciary system so seriously. We've, we've been doing it every quarter, and we have no plans to actually change that. And that, I think, has really been a big uh, boost to the investor psyche to sit here and and come to the market and continue to add, witness the 90,000 that we have, the 200,000 shareholders. And I think that sort of you know institutionalization of the product uh, within sort of the entire real estate spectrum has really given people a lot of confidence. Now, that unfortunately is not something that has really applied to the residential sector. I know that res res people are buying houses and people continue to do that, but there is clearly a level of, I think, governance that the REITs provide that sh give a lot of investors comfort, that give our regulators comfort to say that look, you're, you're, you're abiding by the law, you are putting a lot together to make sure minority investors are protected and they have an actual say in the companies that you run. So I think that whether or not, you, you can buy gold, you can buy a stock, you can buy residential, but something like commercial real estate through a REIT portfolio should absolutely be part of any broad asset allocation and diversification strategy. That, yes. Uh, yeah, Rithik has uh, touched on an important aspect about uh, corporate governance. I would say REITs probably have the highest level of corporate governance, given that the level of disclosure you find in a REIT is very high. When you do an acquisition, you have to go to investors and justify it's an acquisitive acquisition, and you get full details, including about future projections. So, so it gives a great degree of comfort for investors to come and invest in a REIT. That's right. Uh, you touched upon corporate governance and in property-related matters, to have a high standard of corporate governance is uh, one of the game changers if we talk about India. Uh, but Jay Shankar, like, you know, you have sold real REIT uh, as an IPO as well. You sold uh, real estate companies as IPO as well. What could be the difference of uh, retail investors' approach in the two? See, residential play is very different. Uh, see, commercial real estate are high rental income generating asset. A residential uh, property will not get you more than, call it three, three and a half percent. I don't know what those yields are. Those kind of yields are never high income generating. So residential properties will not be so much amenable to a REIT as much as a mall, as much as commercial real estate or maybe warehouses. So these are three asset classes which will come under REIT. When it comes to residential, it will always be a company listing, like you have uh, Lodar that's listed, you have Oberoi that's listed, you have DLF that's uh, listed across both RISI and commercial. Uh, but anyone who's a residential player will prefer to list his company directly uh, in, in the stock market. And uh, the important thing to note about RISI is India is a high growth market. And there are very few residential real estate companies that grow at as fast a clip as the Indian companies have shown in cities of Delhi, 
Bombay, Bangalore and so on. So you will have residential players continue to list, uh, raise QIP as we did for Lodha as well as we have done for Embassy in the past to really fund your uh, growth story. All right. Uh, so these are two uh, very different asset classes. Let's uh, talk about REIT as an investment in terms of the future of growth uh, when it comes to the India's office space. Now, we've seen many global players come set up very swanky offices in the last 10 years. We have seen a very different kind of office space. It's experience-based as well, utility-based as well as it has to have a certain standard which we had not seen in the past. Now, with COVID, there is a bounce back that the industry has seen. Ritwik, how do you see where are we in the stage of growth and bounce back after COVID? And how do you see the growth potential going forward in the next five to 10 years? We are in the early stages of this growth cycle in India. I think if you think about the fact that COVID was a little bit of an existential crisis for commercial real estate, but I would say that it was actually out west where there was far more of uh, an issue with people coming back to the office and people working from home. In India, while there was obviously some dislocation in the market, I think Indians tend... Uh, it's, it's just not the kind of market where you find the that it's conducive to working from home. And I think for a number of different reasons. One, the physical infrastructure at home isn't doesn't lend itself to many things. One, culture, collaboration, cybersecurity. Number two, workspaces that we provide, the kind of the office parks, the total business ecosystems that we have where there's, you know, food courts, amenities. People, that lends itself to people just being more productive. Yes. Where you think about, you know, we have, you know, 15 million square feet parks that rival, you know, Canary Wharf, entire CBDs out west. These are the kinds of parks that, you know, attract global captive centers that we're seeing right now, which is why you've seen this entire explosion in leasing. We were very fortunate to be a part of, you know, having leased sort of 8 million square feet this this last year. But, but that just tells us that there's so much more opportunity. This is an 800 million square feet office market in India that's only going to continue to grow yes. because there's the abundance of talent Companies are setting up stop. You can, you know, obviously see the 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 resilience in India's uh, destiny as a dest as a preferred destination right now yes. for global investment. And yes. as that grows, office spaces are just going to be more and more in demand, and people are going to be, and and senior management worldwide are looking to have people come back to the office. We're a young demographic. We're a demographic that needs to come into the office, be productive. And make sure that your contribute. It's no longer sort of just an offshore or an outsourcing sort of business. You are contributing to the global uh, technology stack, the business stack for multinational companies, you know, across the uh, across the planet. But um, you know, Jayshankar, when we look at the office space and the way the global companies are looking at India, how do you see this particular space growing in the future? And we are not just talking about office spaces; we have malls also in REIT, and probably it will expand to other areas like logistics, warehouse, even data centers. Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question that you posed. As I mentioned at the beginning, the REIT asset class is $2.5 trillion globally. Yes. India is the fastest growing uh, economy. Obviously, you need high class offices across multiple cities in India. Uh, while $10 billion is listed, probably what is not listed is perhaps much higher than even this $10 billion, right, across both uh, uh, malls as well as uh, commercial. And you're going to find similar quantum being uh, uh, invested over the next three to five years. So I think this entire portfolio that's today existing will probably double in three to five years time right. and that would mean more and more investment as far as supply of uh, money is uh, concerned i think there are enough foreign and domestic investors willing to invest as long as high quality paper is available i don't think there's any dearth we saw that when we did the embassy last sell down of uh, blackstone uh, roughly 23 percent 850 million dollars and we had a book which was probably in excess of 2x there's, in, there's enough money available and there's only institutional money. We are not even touched in, the, in that particular uh, transaction with respect to non-institutions. You, so you mentioned huge... Yes, you mentioned a very important point because um, on the exchanges, uh, if a REIT block is sold and an investor can exit, that gives a lot of confidence to this particular asset class in terms of liquidity as well as traction, right? True, absolutely. And $850 million, I think last year, perhaps it ranked among the largest uh, blocks from India 
and perhaps the largest block in real estate globally anywhere. So it tells you how much India has come forward in terms of the depth of the capital markets. That's right. So Ritwik, talking about uh, the other asset classes versus REIT, how would you pitch for a REIT being an important asset class for a diversified portfolio? Well, I, I, I just think about myself, right? As an investor, because I, you know, apart from being, you know, privileged to work in an organization like a REIT and having listed it, I always think about, you know, what does my portfolio look like for the long term? And I think there's always, you know, room for effectively, uh, you know, a, a balanced mix of equities, of fixed income, of, you know, gold or currencies, commodities, and real estate. Yes. So I think about real estate in this form as being effectively more akin to equities because you can just buy it and and hold it and keep it. And I, I, I think for the long term, I think about the fact that, you know, you know, if you think about real estate as part of a portfolio, typically it tends to be between 5 and 15%, really depending on your appetite for where that, where that sits, whether you hold it in a private uh, vehicle, whether you can have it publicly as a REIT, uh, in the form of a REIT. But... In my view, it, it is the perfect instrument for anyone, and I mean, whether for all your listeners, for you, for everybody even sitting in this audience, to really think about having a, having a product that will pay off in the long run. Um, you know, whether you're an early, in, like I've said, if you're a retiree and looking for income, if you're just starting out on your investment journey, you think about the fact that you own a piece of property in India's growth markets, in Bangalore, in Mumbai. So it should always be a part of sort of a portfolio. And and it's not something that, you know, I, I'm not a speculator. I, I, I believe in investing for the long term. So and I, and I think about if I had to educate my own children about buying uh, real estate, you should buy it in the form of something that's safe, that you can actually look at, that is prudently managed, that's, that's well, that doesn't have much leverage uh, on it. And over time will give you the sort of you know returns that you know you expect from whether it's sort of in the mid teens or whatever that portfolio is buy good companies good companies tend and good in in good structures tend to take care of themselves right and uh, jay shankar uh, you know for the indian mindset in terms of dividend uh, cash coming in after every few months is that uh, something that works well uh, with a certain set of investors absolutely uh, you know you're talking about uh, Yields annually in the ballpark of call it between six to seven percent, depending upon which REIT we are talking about, and a total return in in, in mid teens, right? So you are getting an assured return year after year, and a total return as the uh, unit appreciates. So it's it, it's a far more predictable, uh, uh, I, I would say, investment as compared to others. So which is why I would agree with Ritwik, a five percent of overall portfolio. $1.8 trillion uh, of money invested in India, you're talking about a potential $90 billion. We are, we are probably uh, scratching the surface. So next, give it three years, five years, 10 years, it'll be a huge, huge asset class. All right. Next three to five years, it has a huge potential uh, for growth. Any uh, final words from you, Ritwik, on this before we close this? No, I think uh, I'll just say that it's been five years since MBC REIT listed. And in that time, we've seen, you know, uh, the market growth of the 10 billion that Jay has been talking about, and you know, there are four REITs. I think if you think about the next five years, now that we've got uh, a fair sense of how the structure works, really the sky's the limit for actually having more people buy the product, making the product evolve, the capital markets grow. You know, the one thing that I think we, we haven't touched on, but it's a very critical point of real estate in this country, is leverage, is the ability to not be burdened by debt. Yes. And REITs have very stringent rules to make sure that we're prudently governed. Uh, we can only take up to 49% in debt. So you never see those kinds of, we're very good credit. Yes. So these are the things that, you know, really the government's been very pragmatic and very helpful in making sure that they that we have the rules that allow us to grow, that allow us to still sort of give, give the distributions and be, be well governed and, and have the kinds of disclosure. So if you have all those building blocks in, in, in place, I think the next five years and beyond, you'll definitely you see a lot more growth in the sector. And it's been a privilege for us to be a part of this entire exercise to play such a transformative role in India's capital markets. I mean, five years ago, if you'd said, you know, we're going to put a REIT in this country, but then, you know, we, and then you sit back and look, say that after that, we've grown to the size and the scale where we've, which real estate company has distributed close to 10,000 crores in five years, even in the midst of a COVID cycle, I think you would have looked at me like I was crazy. 
at that point. But I think to have the privilege to sit here and say that we've been part of building something that's so transformational and really over the next five to 10 years will completely sort of set the stage for it to mirror what's happening in India's economy. I think that's a very gratifying thing for us. All right. Very interesting points made there, both Ritwik as well as Jay Shankar. Thanks so much for joining us on this segment and making us all understand more about real estate investment trusts as an asset class. With that, it's a wrap on Reed Connect. Thanks so much for tuning in. CNBC TV 18 and CNBC Avas present the Reed Connect in partnership with IRA.